I think they realized that what you was doing was flying a crash every time you flew one. When he made a decision, that was, that was it. He could not change it. We had another big one, which was a 112 feet wingspan, and that was called the Hamel car. My squadron had gone into Market Garden um, 185, I think, and 63 of us came back. And they would uh, perhaps uh, be fighting before they got out of the glider. I think maybe a front or something might have been going through is what pulled all this crazy weather in. Just outside of a little town called Grave, G-R-A-V-E, we called it Grave. Uh, they were just underestimated how much strength the Germans had. Yeah, that was a little low, and the tail wheel caught the top strand of a barbed wire fence. We were helpless without the resupply. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean artillery, I mean rations, I mean ammunition, whatever. Many, many glider pilots killed over there. Yeah. We laying right on top of the mess, right in the middle of a fierce firefight there. I watched the left wing tip go, which was down to probably around the aileron. The British General Bernard L. Montgomery planned this airborne mission through Holland, crossing many bridges until the major bridge over the Rhine at Arnhem and into Germany, expecting the war to be over by Christmas 1944. The mission took place on the 17th of September 1944 and was to take three days to put all units down. And there were to be three sectors, Eindhoven, Nijmegen and Arnhem. However, the Arnhem area was primarily a British responsibility and will not be reviewed in detail in this production. But American troop carrier squadrons flew several of the Arnhem missions. The Pathfinders had been working as teams for the past six months and knew their business well.
The Germans have flooded large sections of Holland. The 82nd Pathfinder's drop at Grave was at 1247 on drop zone O. The 101st Pathfinder's also dropped its troops on drop zone A at 1247. The 53rd Troop Carrier Wing flew 6,712 paratroops of the 101st Airborne aboard 428 C-47s. The weather was generally good. Visibility was three to seven miles. Masses of cumulus clouds were above 2,500 feet. At the Eindhoven sector, the main paratroop drop was put down between 1,300 and 1,340 hours. These serials met intense flak after they crossed over the German front lines. The village of Best Holland, a mile or so southwest of drop zone B and C, had put up intense and persistent flak. 17 troop carrier planes were shot down and over 100 damaged in the 101st sector. This enemy fire had little effect on the delivery of these troops from the air, as the skillful pilots coaxed their planes to the drop zones. At least four C-47 pilots gave their lives to deliver their troops. These jumps were some of the best of the war, as reported in after-action reports. It was a real, real rugged airplane, and it reacted good. It was built out of wood and, and fiber, and it was, had, uh, it was a sturdy airplane. And even though I think they realized that what you was doing was flying a crash every time you flew one in combat. Following the paratroops into the Zahn or Eindhoven area came two serials of 35 planes from the 437th Troop Carrier Group, pulling Waco CG-4A gliders. These cut loose at 1348 and 1355, respectively. 53 gliders reached the landing zone safely. The German gunners found the glider formations good targets as they came within range and destroyed 19% of the tow ships which were shot down or later had to be salvaged. It should be noted, however, that 80% of the personnel and 75% of the heavy equipment and vehicles carried were effectively delivered. But a glider pilot is one of the better pilots of, the, of that day. And one reason for it is when he made a decision, that was, that was it. He could not change it. Or he may change it a little bit, but when he saw that spot on the ground where he was going to, that's the, he couldn't pull the coal to it and go around and come back again. He had to get there, and get there the easiest and the best and the safest way. At the same time, in the Nijmegen sector, 11 paratroop serials of 481 planes carrying 7,229 troops were put down by the 50th and 52nd troop carrier wings. A slight haze was reported, but destination weather was favorable, with cloud bases above 2,500 feet. Visibility, seven miles or more. For the most part, these paratroops were put down within one and a half miles or closer to the drop zones.
A single glider serial of 50 planes released its gliders at 1347, a mile or so short of landing zone N. 48 survived to land the heavy muscle part of the airborne's equipment, like jeeps, trailers, and artillery. The British flew 29 Horsa and six Waco CG-4A gliders into landing zone N in the 82nd sector, loaded with headquarters of 1st Airborne Corps, the first time a Corps headquarters was flown into combat. Another British glider mission, headed for landing zone S, put down 132 Horsa gliders. A third English glider mission went into landing zone Z, with 137 Horsa, and 13 huge Hamilcar gliders. However, 39 horses had been lost en route. Between 1353 and 1408, 2,110 British paratroops were put down almost perfectly by American troop carrier planes. The British glider, they, the main battle glider was the Horsa, which was a medium-sized glider. Now, we had another big one, which was a 112 feet wingspan, and that was called the Hamilcar, designed to carry a, a load of some seven and a half tons, and that could be a, a Tetrarch, uh, which was a British light tank, or the Locust, which was the American light tank, or you could carry a small scraper or dozer or other vehicles. But the, uh, the main point of having the big Hamel car was to get in some form of armor, which otherwise the airborne forces would lack uh, once they were on the ground. My squadron had gone into Market Garden um, 185, I think, and 63 of us came back. Uh, of course, we found out afterwards a lot of them were prisoners. Well, we went on the second day. There were, we, we landed in three days. Um, my squadron went in on the second day. It was, we had enormous fighter protection. Um, in retrospect, the whole thing was a disaster, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad when we started. You know, we, we went 10,000, people were in the British 1st Airborne Division, including the glider pilots, and 2,000 came out. The trouble was we landed too far from our objective. I mean, we were planned to land too far from the objective. At the end of D-Day, everything seemed to be going very well. The plight of the British at Arnhem was desperate, but as yet, they did not know it. The Germans on September 8th had moved the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions into the Arnhem area for refitting putting an overwhelming number of guns and tanks in this combat area. Also, the tough German General Field Marshal Walter Model had his headquarters at Osterbeck, less than three miles from the British landing zones. And he saw what was happening and leaped into action as he was seeing the British paratroopers coming down. I think I should say something about the uh, glider soldiers that we carried in the back end of those gliders. The glider pilots sat in a, uh, uh, a big open, almost uh, uh, amphitheater affair where he could see in all directions, up and down and all, all the sides. But the glider troopers that he carried in the back could not see very well. And uh, they were uh, frightened, as uh, you could imagine. and. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for the people that we carried, and uh, most of the other glider pilots that I know feel the same way. They were able to keep their fears and uh, feelings under, under control while they were in, the gl in gliders, even though that they were very fear fearful where they were going to go, not only of the flying, but the fact that they were going to be landed in a heavy, contested area and that they would uh, perhaps uh, be fighting before they got out of the glider. And uh, so with uh, all kinds of fears involved, they were able to uh, keep themselves under control. And I think that uh, the glider trooper of World War II 
is uh, one of the war's real uh, unsung heroes. On D plus one, or the 18th of September, the 101st Airborne was to be reinforced by a 450 glider mission of the 53rd Troop Carrier Wing to Landing Zone W. General Anthony McAuliffe rode the lead glider of the lead serial of the six serials. When we, when we took off, uh, we were, you know, fairly early in the morning uh, because it was about one o'clock when we touched down. So if we back up, it's, where are we, nine o'clock or so? Um, and it, it was fairly smooth, but uh, it got choppy over the water. It's this, I think maybe a front or something might have been going through is what pulled all this crazy weather in. It was kind of choppy, and you were flying it. It wasn't like you could trim her up and, and uh, just kind of sit back and make a little correction now and then. You were flying. You had to fly it because, she, you know, she's bumpy. And um, you, you, were, you were tired. You didn't realize it because the closer you got, and particularly after you got overland there, you figure out, okay, you know, Another half hour or so, it's all over. Well, we were just a shade over four hours. Had a uh, an airborne guy sitting in the seat there who would not touch this glider. I was never lucky with, with any of the uh, other than glider pilot, co-pilots. They never wanted to fly the darn thing. Takeoffs were begun at 1120 at Grenham Common area and took the northern route to Landing Zone W. 424 gliders landed safely on or near Landing Zone W between 1430 and 1620. When you come off that tow plane, if you had a good tow pilot, and later in the, in the war, when we had better observation and better pictures, we could see where we were going and we knew how we had to get in there. And about all you really need to do was make a base leg and then turn into the field. The main thing that I felt like, get on the ground and uh, a good glider pilot from the time he got off if he got off at 800 feet could probably have it on the ground in less than a minute so it uh, get on the ground was the main thing you want to think about when you're flying a glider in combat captain ec thornton an airborne observer later reported that these landings were splendidly executed and were 95 percent successful 2605 troops 151 jeeps, 122 trailers, and 244 tons of cargo were put down. We went, landed in uh, an LZ just outside of a little town called Grave, G-R-A-V-E. We called it Grave, and unluckily that's what it was for some of our fellows. We had good weather. It was a little rough uh, the first part of the flight. But after that, it was clear weather. But we ran into some opposition after we got over Belgium. We were flying at 1,000 feet, so they could throw rocks at us. We could look down through the plexiglass nose and see them even sighting us with rifles. So we felt like we were ducks up there, and they were duck shooting. But the uh, anti-aircraft was the worst. Took a hit near the tail of my glider. And it, at first, I didn't know whether I had any tail left or not, because it was vibrating very bad. And the tow pilot was hollering at me, are you still there, are you still there? I couldn't leave go of the wheel long enough, because it was vibrating so bad to answer him. And we didn't have any co-pilots. And the sergeant that I had in the right seat, I looked at him trying to get him to do something, and I'll never forget him. He had his head down between his knees. And I could see the back of his helmet. And I said, look on my right wing and see if they got hit, because I want to know what position they're in. And I can't use the expression. He, used then, he said, I'm not looking at a blank thing. And he never did. <laughs> at the same time, in the Nijmegen sector, 
the 82nd Airborne seemed to be close to disaster. Landing zone N and T were in enemy hands, plus heavy pressure at many parts of its perimeter. By 1400, the estimated time of arrival of the gliders, the landing zones were retaken, but the Germans dug in around the edge of the landing zones, giving them a good position at the glider landings. This glider mission by the 50th and 52nd wings took two hours to get the gliders and their tugs into the air due to weather problems. These were over three hour flights without co-pilots in much prop wash that put extra stress and strain on these glider pilots. In all, 385 gliders landed within the 82nd lines. 69 gliders failed to land within friendly territory for various reasons, like faulty navigation and improper landing zone observance. But most of these troops and pilots made their way to the American lines, losing part or all of their cargoes. Now, when they went into Margaret Garden, they were way ahead of their advanced troops. They expected us, when we went in there, to land about 20, 25 miles in behind the German troops, is the way we were told. I went down up there in a place called Moo Collin, and then uh, we traveled several days uh, and nights. We just hid at daytime and traveled at night and was getting back, to, and I came back through Belgium. Uh, they were just underestimated how much strength the Germans had in there, and they were good uh, soldiers. They were top-notch when they come in there. We had a lot of flak going in. We had a lot of ground for when we landed over there. They had machine gun boxes set up. We called them machine gun nests. And our paratroopers, we, they dropped those in there. I was on one of those runs on a C-47. Dropped paratroopers in a few days ahead of this invasion. It was pretty obvious to them Germans, I'm sure, that we were coming in because we made all the preliminary to go in there. But these 385 gliders delivered to the 82nd Division, 177 jeeps, 106 trailers, 54 pieces of artillery, and 211 tons of cargo. B-24 bomber resupply missions arrived about 20 minutes after the last glider serials landed. 252 B-24s, with their ball turrets removed, carrying two tons of supplies packed in 20 containers that were dropped from both the bomb racks and pushed from the turret wells and the rear hatches. These aircraft came in over the drop zones at 150 miles an hour, at 300 feet, in a nine-ship formation of Vs in trail. 80% of the supplies were recovered in the 82nd sector, but results were poor in the 101st area. Only 50% recovered on drop zone A and 20% on landing zone W. The climbing turn off landing zone W was a mistake. Heavy anti-aircraft fire from the best area shot down three bombers and five had to crash land. Four were also lost in the 82nd sector. At the same time in the Arnhem sector, American troop carrier planes put 2,110 British paratroops down on drop zone Y. 295 British aircraft left England towing 271 gliders, and these were landed on landing zone S and landing zone X. But only 12 tons of supplies from the 87 tons dropped were recovered. At the end of the second day, the Allies had fallen seriously behind schedule, but success still seemed to be within their reach. D plus two, the 19th of September. The weather proved to be worse than predicted. 10 serials of a total of 385 gliders were scheduled for the 101st sector. 213 reached the landing zone, and of the other 172, 130 were recalled to England. 42 went down in either enemy or friendly territory due to bad weather. I guess the easiest mission and the worst mission was Holland, and the reason for that was because we ran through a lot of bad weather, but when we got into the to the drop zone, why uh, those fields in Holland, they looked so good and so big, it was easy to get down. At the same time in the Nijmegen sector, General Gavin had a 25 mile perimeter to defend, with part of his division still in England. Plus, he still had the big bridge at Nijmegen to capture. The glider mission was postponed due to bad weather in England, 
and the 82nd was now running critically short of both food and ammunition. We landed uh, at a place uh, between Nijmegen and uh, Grave, G-R-A-V-E. You pronounce it Grave, we all pronounce it Grave, you know, we were going to our graves, you know. And that was, that's where we landed. Anyway, I went in as a co-pilot. I still got the air medal for doing it. And he, he, uh, he said to me when, <laughs> when we got near our landing zone, our LZ, he says, oh, and you landed. He says, I haven't landed one of these things in three years. <laughs> so you landed, so I landed it. And uh, the only thing I did, I was a little low, and the tail wheel caught the top strand of a barbed wire fence. Well, it sounded like we'd been hit by a 88 millimeter shell because you're in like the inside of a base drum with all that fabric and everything else. And so we thought we'd been hit, but I looked back and everybody was all right. In the Arnhem sector, the 19th of September was a day of disaster. The British attacks failed, and by nightfall, it was evident that the initiative had passed to the Germans with their two SS Panzer divisions. Bad weather prevented glider and paratroop operations in all sectors until the 23rd of September, or D plus six. Then 84 gliders were sent into the 101st sector, and 79 of these were effective. We landed a little place called Zahn, which is right outside of Eindhoven. And apparently the gliders were landing in the same fields that we were landing in because I was getting out of my harness when a glider crashed about 100 yards from me. And uh, of course, I had other things to do, so I didn't go over to the glider, but I've often wondered what happened to that glider pilot because he was trapped in there, and I've never seen fellows with axes trying to cut him out of the glider. And at one time at a reunion here in Dallas, uh, somebody showed a picture of this glider, this particular glider, and I made the remark that I saw that, and I wondered if the, if the glider pilot lived. Somebody said, well, yeah, there he is right over there. So I got to talk to the glider pilot who provided that. We were helpless without their resupply. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean artillery, I mean rations, I mean ammunition, whatever. But they were the backbone of the invasion, I would think. At the same time, 406 gliders were dispatched to the 82nd, of which 351 were effective, putting down 92 jeeps, 52 loaded trailers, 24 artillery pieces, and 253 tons of supplies. Here, the first serial reached landing zone O at 1603, about four hours after takeoff. These reinforcements, plus the very brave Polish paratroopers sent to Arnhem and needed supplies, arrived too late to make any big difference on the overall objective of capturing the bridge over the Rhine at Arnhem. This, uh, on September 23rd, the, uh, the, the second, uh, yeah, we call it a Golf, uh, planes and, and uh, airborns uh, came down with, uh, with, the, with the gliders. And they bring more ammunition and men for General Gavin. It was also the reason that he, that he said, uh, I have not, not enough men, but we, we, we must have the bridges, the railroad bridges and the others. So uh, in, in, in that days, he bring with uh, small boats, some men over the river, to the other side, and many, many men are killed. Uh, uh, yeah, he makes a, a smoke screen, but the wind blows it away, and, and the Germans, he, he, yeah, they were on the other side from the river, and he, he could shoot it down, it, it, uh, and shoot the boats, uh, like, so that he got down in the river. Yeah, many, many paratroopers are killed there. Mm -hmm. The swift flowing Rhine was a natural defense for the Germans, and the taking of this large bridge directly into Germany would have had a big influence on ending the war. But these were by far the best glider and troop carrier operations of the war. At midnight on September 20th, 300 glider pilots were called out to help relieve the hard-pressed 82nd Airborne in the Mook area. Glider pilots were lightly armed. General Gavin told them to arm themselves with any weapons they could get, especially from the dead. And that is directly on the border from the Reichswald. And General Gavin said, you take the weapons from uh, my killed man, and you hold Middela. And they did it. Many, many glider pilots killed over there. Yeah. Captain E.D. Andros, glider pilot, 
commanded 100 or so glider pilots, relieving the 505th Parachute Infantry for three days and nights. Many of these same glider pilots were being evacuated back to Brussels, down Hell's Highway, when their truck convoy was ambushed by the Germans south of Weigel. The truck drivers dived for cover, but the glider pilots fought back, turned the trucks around as drivers under point-blank range of the German tanks and guns, and drove 15 of them to safety. Dr. J.C. Warren, in his Historical Studies No. 97 for the United States Air Force Air University Study Airborne Operations in World War II, says, this performance by glider pilots would seem to call for some commendation. The American glider pilot turned out to be an uncut diamond for the Army Air Corps, who for the most part never perceived that they had a treasure in these uncommon men who could live on the edge or brink without falling apart. The Airborne Command came much closer to that perception. In combat, the gliders were towed into the most hostile environment that one could imagine, flying unarmed gliders that were neither crash-proof nor bulletproof. Theoretically, we were supposed to go in around 500 feet. And of course, theory and, and actuality are always two different things, just like now in, in theory, they called it a vertical envelopment. And theoretically, the paratroopers would go in and clear the enemy out so we'd have a place to land, a protected place to land. There was just one problem with that. The Krauss never did cooperate. And so in most cases, we land right on top of the mess, right in the middle of a fierce firefight there. And I know whenever we came in, I guess we were about uh, 10, 10 or 12 feet off the ground. I felt something come loose in the back of the glider and it sounded like a giant popcorn popper going off. Well, what it was is German machine gunner, and he just didn't have enough lead on us. And later on, I saw the back end of our glider, and that thing had about, looked to me like about 10,000 holes in it. It wasn't that many holes in it, but the whole back end was riddled. And there's those German machine gun bullets going through the tail of the glider back there. From a troop carrier point of view, Market was a brilliant success when all was said and done. It was the heroism of the men who flew burning, disintegrating planes as coolly as if they were on review. Gliders that stayed on tow through unbelievable flak and murderous small arms fire to reach the landing zones. When we uh, started to pick up flak, which was almost immediately after turning off the IP, I lost one of the airborne men. He was sitting right in back of me and he caught a direct hit with possibly a 20 or 40 millimeter. They, uh, kept continually uh, hitting us with small arms and flak all the way in. It was a continuous run. And uh, I watched the left wing tip go, which is down to probably around the aileron. The right side of the glider was blown out, had a holes all over it. You could uh, just see air through all of the wings. And I'd lost a rudder, not the vertical stabilizer, but the rudder. And I didn't know this at the time, I just thought they'd uh, clip the cables. But the, after I did get back, the, co the pilot of the tow ship in back of me said that they watched the rudder come off, and it came right straight at them, and uh, then it turned 90 degrees, and they thought it was coming in their cockpit, and they ducked, and it went up over the cockpit, and that was the last they seen of it. But they kept watching uh, to see if I was gonna, what kind of trouble I was gonna be in. So we're basically, I was flying it with the ailerons and the uh, elevators. And not knowing any different, it didn't work too badly. And uh, so finally, uh, uh, there was a burst of machine gun fire. And typically, the Germans, they'd fire an entire belt or drum. And I could watch these tracers go down through the tow ship. And they went, uh, came in between the left engine and the fuselage of the uh, tow ship and then followed the tow rope down and it came right through the glider between me and the co-pilot seat. And when that happened, they blew out the tow mechanism, and the instrument panel, uh, all the plexiglass and the whole works and we were in free flight at that point. So the best I could do was find a field that looked uh, fairly decent and uh, uh, knowing full well I really didn't have the capabilities of making any erratic moves because uh, if I, I was afraid if I did, it was going to come apart. That was what my fear was. But it made a fairly good landing in a beet field, a cow beet field, they call it. And almost immediately upon landing, made contact with the Dutch underground. 
which was kind of a fluke because this, the Germans were coming across to one side of the field after us. And I gave them a burst of the Tommy gun and they flattened out, which is all we were trying to do, just buy some time. And there was a Dutch farmer back of us yelling, Ick Hollander. Well, I don't speak Dutch and I had no idea what he was talking about. And my first fear was that he was yelling, here they are. And in order to make this tree line, we we're going to have to go right through about where this farmer was standing. And so as I figured there's only going to be one thing happen. If he caused us any problem, there wasn't going to be a, a farmer around. So anyway, as we got up near the fence, he parted it and made motions to follow him. Well, this was our introduction to the underground. And from there, he passes off to another farmhouse and then another farmhouse and on and on. And like I say, for six weeks, we just kept moving along. Yes, as General Gavin later said, there was no failure in market. Thank you.